So, Mr. President, I, I come to the floor to discuss the unprecedented obstruction that has faced President Trump's nominees for the past 26 months and counting, and to announce that the Senate is going to do something about it. Mr. President, the systematic across-the-board delay and obstruction that have crippled this administration's nominations is unique in American history. Every presidential election since Adams beat Jefferson in 1796 has left some senators disappointed that their side lost. There's always a losing side, and they're never happy about it. But the past two years have been the first time, Mr. President, the first time ever that the unhappy party has used Senate procedure to systematically blockade the new president's nominees and prevent him from even staffing up his administration. So let me say that again. <clears throat> Since January 2017, for the first time in the 230-year history of the United States Senate, a minority of senators have used Senate procedure to systematically prevent the President of the United States from putting a full team in place. During the first two years of the last six presidential administrations, before President Trump, 24 total cloture votes had to be held to advance a nomination. But in President Trump's first two years, 128 cloture votes on nominees. For 42 different executive branch positions, cloture votes have been required for the first time in history, first time ever. Uncontroversial assistant secretaries, agencies, general counsels, never required cloture votes before, ever, until this particular Democratic minority. Or just compare President Trump's first two years to President Obama's. Overall, we confirmed 22 percent fewer nominations for President Trump and sent more than twice as many back to the White House. Take just the Foreign Relations Committee as one example. The share of nominees sent to the Foreign Relations Committee who were still not confirmed after President Trump's first two years was more than three times, three times what it was for President Obama. To be clear, the lion's share of all this is not controversial, high-profile figures. In most cases, they're unambiguously well-qualified nominees for critical but lower-profile jobs. For example, it took more than six months, six months, and several tragic railroad accidents that made national news before a minority of senators would allow us to confirm the president's nominee to head the Federal Railroad Administration. Six months and railroad accidents to get us to confirm the president's nominee to head the Federal Railroad Administration. He had worked in railroads as an engineer, manager, and executive for 45 years. Our colleagues on the Commerce Committee voice voted him out of committee. And actually, when Democrats finally allowed his nomination to come up out here on the floor, when they finally allowed that, he was confirmed by voice vote. But despite the fact that nobody actually objected to this nominee, this important job was held empty for six long months. Obstruction for obstruction's sake. It's the same story with even the least controversial judicial nominees. Last January, it took more than a week of floor time to confirm four district judges, all of whom had been voice voted out of the Judiciary Committee the previous autumn. But still, months of delays. And then cloture votes were required for each. But once we finally plowed through to the confirmation votes, they were all confirmed unanimously. Months of delays and procedural roadblocks for four bipartisan nominees whom not a single senator actually opposed. 
Not, this is not a principal maneuver, not thoughtful use of minority powers, obstruction simply for the sake of obstruction. This historic campaign isn't fair to our duly elected president, and more importantly, it is not fair to the American people. The American people deserve the government they elected. They deserve for important positions to be promptly filled with capable individuals, not held open indefinitely out of political spite. And from an institutional perspective, as we all acknowledge, this is completely unsustainable. But if we allow it to persist, it seems guaranteed to become standard operating procedure for every administration going forward. So let's assume two years from now, my side is in the minority. And there's a Democratic president. If we allow this to persist, we'll be doing the same thing to those guys that they've been doing to us. It'll be the new norm. Some of our colleagues who are leading this systematic obstruction are actually running for president themselves. Well, these tactics will virtually guarantee that any future Democratic administration is subjected to the same paralysis. Everybody will be doing it. Is this how American government is supposed to work from here on out? <coughs> Whichever party loses the White House, basically prohibits the new president from standing up an administration. <clears throat> yeah, we, we can't accept this, Mr. President. It just can't be allowed to continue. We need to restore the Senate to the way it functioned for literally decades. Remember, the idea that nominees would regularly require cloture votes completely foreign to the Senate until this sad chapter began during President Bush 41's administration in the early 2000s. <clears throat> As of 1968, 68, cloture had never been required for any nomination any nomination. As of 1978, it had been required for two. Two. As of 1978. Until 2003, in no Congress, none, had more than 12 cloture motions ever been needed for nominations. But now again, President Trump's chosen nominees faced 128 cloture votes during the Congress just passed. So this entire conversation is a modern aberration. It hasn't been going on forever. This is a fairly recent thing. This behavior is new. So we need to restore the Senate's tradition in this area. Fortunately, we have a clear roadmap to do just that. In 2013, immediately after President Obama's Re-election, 78 senators, including me, passed a bipartisan standing order to speed up the consideration of many presidential nominees. 78 members of this body passed a standing order to help President Obama speed up the executive calendar. It reduced the post-closure time for most nominations without touching the Supreme Court circuit courts, or the highest levels of the executive branch. Essentially, everything else got a more streamlined process so nominees could be confirmed more efficiently. Again, Mr. President, President Obama had just been inaugurated for the second time days earlier. You better believe Republicans were disappointed we'd lost. But we did not throw a systematic tantrum. Instead, a sizable number of us came over and joined the Democrats to help the Senate process non-controversial nominations as it had for the vast bulk of the history of the Senate. I was a Republican leader in the minority, and I still supported it. 
We judged it was the right thing to do, and we did it. The standing order passed 78 to 16. So today, Mr. President, I'm filing closure on a resolution that takes that bipartisan effort as its blueprint. This resolution from Senator Blunt and Senator Langford would implement very similar steps and make them a permanent part of the Senate going forward. The Supreme Court, circuit courts, cabinet level executive positions, and certain independent boards and commissions would not change. But for most other nominations, for the hundreds, literally hundreds of lower level nominations that every new president makes, post-closure debate time would be reduced from 30 hours to two hours. This would keep the floor moving. It would facilitate more efficient consent agreements. And most importantly, it would allow the administration, finally, finally, two years into its tenure, to staff numerous important positions that remain unfilled with nominees who've been languishing. This resolution has come up through the regular order, through the Rules Committee, and next week we'll vote on it. It deserves the same kind of bipartisan vote that Senator Schumer and Senator Reid's proposal received back during the Obama administration. Now, I understand that many of my Democratic colleagues have indicated they'd be all for this reform as long as it doesn't go into effect until 2021, when they obviously hope someone else might be in the White House. But they're reluctant to support it now. Give me a break, Mr. President. That is unfair on its face. My Democratic colleagues were more than happy to support a similar proposal back in 2013 under President Obama. They whisper in our ears privately. They'd support it now if it took effect in 2021. Oh, but they, you know, can't support it now, especially under these unprecedented circumstances, simply because we have a Republican president. So look, Mr. President, fair is fair. <clears throat> Members of this body should only support reforms that, that, would, that they would be ready to support in the minority as they are in the majority. Uh, put another way, if we are in, my side is in the minority two years from now, I don't think this will be an unfair uh, it will not disadvantage us uh, in the front in, in, in the wake of a new Democratic president. This is a change the institution needs, a change the institution made already, basically, with a two-year experiment when President Obama was in office. This is a reform that every member should embrace when their party controls the White House and when it does not control the White House. So I would urge every one of my colleagues, let's get the Senate back to the normal historical pattern for handling presidential nominations. Let's give President Trump, as well as all future presidents, a functional process for building their administrations. Let's give the American people the government they actually elected. And let's seize this chance to do so through the bipartisan regular order that we're pursuing here, both in committee and now on the floor. The status quo is unsustainable for the Senate and for the country. It's unfair to this president and to future presidents of either party. It cannot stand, and Mr. President, it will not stand. 